Our next question, Jim, sent to Corny Drive Through at gmail.com from Danny Byers in Covington, Kentucky. Oh, for heaven's sake, what did you just say? Danny Byers in Covington, Kentucky. Covington. Covington, Kentucky. Covington, Kentucky. Covington. Not Covington, Covington. As you right know. Up the, right up there across the river from Cincinnati. My Aunt Lola and Uncle Tommy lived in Covington on 13th Street for years and years and years. Did they know Danny Byers? I, no, they had. Well, they did know the Byers family. They always oh. told me stay away from the Byers family. Oh, wow. They were big troublemakers up there. Well, here's Danny's question. As Danny, you, I got your note. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. As you know, I am stoned as hell. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should stay away from them, Jim. Yeah, apparently Aunt Lola was a proper judge of people. As you know, I am stoned as hell waiting out the COVID-19 in this bunker in northern Kentucky. <laughs> He's in a bunker. I've been listening every day and turning neighbors on to the YouTube broadcasts. Can you settle an argument about Terry Funk for us? I told the neighbor Funk was wrestling in a small Kentucky town near Bowling Green back in the 1980s, and a little old 80-year-old grandma tried to kill him with a thirty-eight pistol over Jerry the King Lawler. He's calling me a liar. We agreed to let you be the final word. I know what happened. There wasn't any footage, but the regional news covered it when it happened. Don't know the details, but didn't the Kentucky State Police have to remove the old woman? And that's the Well, <laughs> there is historical precedent for old ladies with handguns having to be removed from wrestling events in the state of Kentucky. But I have never heard of it happening during one of the Lawler and Funk matches. Now, now you would have been there for that more than likely. Well, here's the thing: phrase where how how did he phrase where it occurred again? Uh, let's see, in a small Kentucky town near Bowling Green back in the 1980s. Okay, there's the problem. Terry Funk never made any small Kentucky towns in Bowling Green near Bowling Green in the 1980s because he was already too big of a star and. <laughs> Actually, Bowling Green is a small Kentucky town. It, it, Terry didn't even make the spot shows that small. Terry, during that run with Lawler, made Louisville, Evansville, Lexington, Nashville, and Memphis, and there may have and, and a, a couple of Jackson, Tennessees. Uh, he was on no spot shows whatsoever. Um, I'm not denying, and also the if if it was in Louisville then the Kentucky State Police would have not been involved because they used the Louisville City Police as security. So I'm not saying that multiple incidents didn't happen. I'm sure in, in little towns near Bowling Green that many women were carted out with handguns. I'm sure that Lawler and Funk caused some problem in Louisville at some point in time because there were a number of security incidents during that time. I don't remember a, a old woman with a handgun on that specific run uh i think he's conflating a bunch of things that have all happened down through history how many times when you were either a photographer or playing the music into the boom box or, or into the microphone from the boom box how many times do you remember seeing a gun pulled at a wrestling show um well thankfully i never actually was close enough to see the gun. <laughs> there was um there were several stories that uh, were related about the cops either grabbing somebody with a gun. Because, see, I was never on the heel aisle way going back after a match. I was always still up at the ring. There was a couple stories of people grabbing, or the cops grabbing people with a gun on them. One guy had his hand in his pocket, as I recall. One was never pulled in the building, as best I can remember, in Louisville. But they, you know, as somebody just tweeted me and asked me about the uh, the time you remember uh, a guy shot in Chicago at Bobby Heenan and Nick Bockwinkle when they were fucking Vern Gagne around and missed all of them and shot two or three people at ringside. Bobby told me about that himself. And you would always have guys coming in and telling or cops coming in and telling stories about, yeah, I tackled this guy. And when we got him to the back, he had this knife about a foot long. 
or he had this gun on him or he had whatever the fuck in his pocket. The, the cops used to love to come back and tell you that when they had tackled somebody, they'd come back and tell you everything he was carrying that he could have used on you. And the, one of the biggest ones in Louisville at the gardens was I think in 76 Lawler was still a heel. He's fucking getting heat on the baby face. I've got a picture of the cops carrying this guy out, by the way, he's getting heat on the fucking baby face and this guy hits the ring, but he, when marks would hit the ring and try to attack the heels, what would save you a lot of times was the ropes would flummox them. Cause I mean, you've seen people trying to get in a ring at a wrestling show that don't normally get in a ring civilians and fans and just playing around and they get all fucked up when there's no pressure on them. Right. So a lot of times these guys, they'll run and they try to dive underneath the bottom rope and slide in. That's where you got them. As soon as he slid in, he's starting to come up. He's on his hands and knees. Lawler football kicked this guy under the chin, and it looked like a cartoon the way his head snapped up on a fucking eight-foot neck and then back down. And he and the cops had him by the feet by that point, and they jerked him right out on his face, and they hauled him out. Come to find out, he just got out on parole from prison for murder. And the first thing he does is he, he's going to hit the ring and beat the shit out of Jerry Lawler. It didn't work out like he planned. So, you, you know, you never knew, but a lot of the, you just assume that's why if anybody, when you were going down the aisle way, had their either hand in either pocket, either kick them in the balls or just punch them and worry about it later. Cause their chances are, they're not reaching for their wallet. Didn't Johnny Valentine have a thing he would say, and I may be getting it slightly wrong where if you're walking back and there's one guy who won't get out of the way. Everyone else is clearing out. And there's one guy facing you and he won't get out of the way. Yeah. Walk around him. Yeah, he's the one. He's the Just one. Sad step. Because he's wanting you to do something. And uh, a lot of times, you know, it, it, well, like, it's not the big burly guy. Although there was one time in Biloxi, Mississippi, fuck, this fucking big. He looked like Plowboy Frazier if Plowboy had an even larger head. Uh, just a big corn fed farm guy glommed onto Bobby and Bobby, all he could do was reach up and hook him in a front face lock. And the guy started standing up and Bobby's legs were fucking trailing around. This guy had to be three fifty, right? And his Bobby's legs are up in the air and the cops are trying to get, it's a whole skirmish. There's other fights going on. So every cop is not just going after this guy and this Bobby wouldn't let go of him. And the guy wouldn't, put Bobby down he wiped out like half a fucking ringside with Bobby until finally he got tired with <laughs> Bobby's 200 and something pounds on him and he fucking bent over and Bobby's feet got to the ground again he was able to fucking get him down and and then the cops took over um but it's not always the danger it's it's either an old man or sometimes even an old woman or somebody that you wouldn't look at they're the ones that's going to slip in and either stick you or whatever and and you're not even paying attention because you're looking at all the the visual threats. When was the first time you heard the story about the fan pulling the gun to protect the junkyard dog from Michael Hayes? The first night I was in the downtown municipal auditorium, <laughs> Christmas night, 1983, when they said, oh, so you got to watch these people. Because I had asked, actually, because I went out, and at that point in time, this was one of the, the first house show we had made in Mid-South Wrestling. But, um, you know, I'd seen some footage from other places, uh, the, the, the arenas that they ran. And also I've come from Memphis and a lot of the Memphis towns, you had like a rope around the ring with the, the little metal stands. And it was the clothesline. Don't come in this ringside area. But I looked out in new Orleans. They had the, you've seen them on cops when they do the Mardi Gras episodes, the bicycle rack metal railings with NOPD or new Orleans police or whatever on them. They actually had those all the way to the ring in the in the auditorium from the door you came out all the way down the aisle and all the way around the ring. And there was like 15 feet, easily 15 feet in between the ring and the, the railing. And that was unusual. Usually there in those days, six or eight feet because they had to get more ringside in. And that's when the boys started telling me, well, it didn't used to be that way. And they had to make it that way. but And then they started telling me all the stories about the New Orleans downtown auditorium. The room right next to the back door, we'd, we'd park in a, a parking lot out back and the cops would watch the area and you'd walk in that back door to the locker room. But there was a small room right next to the back door 
when any of the fans jumped in the ring and tackled a fucking heel and the cops grabbed him and brought him back, they would hold them there. And when the heel came back from the ring, the cops would give the heel the option of going into that room with the fan and closing the door for two minutes so that they could discuss all the things they apparently still needed to discuss. And the cops would stay outside. And then after the two minutes, they'd go, you know, knock, knock if it took that long. And the wrestler would leave and then they'd go get what was left from the fan and throw him out in the parking lot. Tony Zane was one of the, uh, he was friends with Arn Anderson. They were both from um, a fucking goddamn now I've lost uh, 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 Arn's hometown, Georgia. Got Rome, Rome, Georgia. Tony Zane was from Rome, Georgia. D Tony dated Dusty Rhodes' his daughter for a little while. And as a job guy, that put tremendous pressure on him. But he was working Mid-South. He ran in to do a, a pull-apart one time between JYD and I think DiBiase. And he got stabbed. The job guy got stabbed by a fan while doing a pull-apart. And then they told me the story of the, the fucking dog and, and being blind in the corner. That was the building where the, the guy came over the rail with the gun and said that the Freebird said, don't worry, dog, I got him. So all these stories... I'm like, fuck. So that's why, you know. <laughs> that's you know, why you wore a bulletproof vest. Well, yeah, that, that was one of the, you know, one of the reasons why in some of these situations. <laughs> uh, but but really in New Orleans, by that point, it was better because that 15 feet around the ring, the the New Orleans police bicycle rack railings, they had, fuck, they brought the cops on horseback to clear the parking lot out or the, the back entrance. Um, you know, after the matches were over with to keep people from starting shit in the parking lot. So it was better by the time we got there. The the towns were, that were bad when we got there was the Tulsa's and the Homa, Louisiana's and the fucking Little Rock, Arkansas, which is where the cops actually gave me the bulletproof vest. When when they got new vests, the Little Rock Police Department, the, one of the main guys that worked the security at Barton Coliseum, brought it to me and gave it to me. And, and this was his quote. I think you need this more than I do. He said here, he said, now remember <laughs> it won't stop ice picks, but it's good for, for knives and then bullets. If they hit the blah, blah, blah. But ice, I said, thank you for bringing up. I hadn't thought of ice picks. yet. <laughs> Appreciate you bringing that up for me. But in, in New Orleans, it, it, the dog was so hot with that thing. But when DiBiase turned on him, that's when they had to take DiBiase out of the building in the trunk of Grizzly Smith's car. And he had to drive down the, drive down the road before he could let Ted out because the people were waiting for DiBiase. But they knew Grizzly and he was everybody's favorite. And he was, you know, a, a beloved wrestling legend around there to the fans. So they let him pass right by. They didn't know that DiBiase was closed up in the trunk of his car. They'd have killed him. They'd have burned the car with him in it. In your Midnight Express book, notoriously out of print. <laughs> notoriously. You, you reprint some death threats that you received yeah. at various points. When was the first time, you know, I don't know if you were sitting in the locker room and someone came over and said, oh, you should know this came in. Like, when was the first time you were alerted to the idea there was a death threat against you? Well, see, here's the thing. A lot of those that were printed in the book they didn't they didn't send those to the goddamn newspaper. Hey, tell Cornette I'm gonna kill him. They sent them to they were addressed to me directly, care of TBS or care of Jim Crockett promotions or whatever in the mail. So I would open, I'd be the first one to see them. And about look at this one. Every once in a while I'd show the boys, this guy seems, you know, quite serious. Cause I mean, you know, you differentiated the ones from the 18 or 16 or 14 year old girls that were obviously written in colored pen and on colored stationery. And it, one of them, even literally a quote was when I turn 18, I'm going to find you and kill you for what you did to the rock and roll express. Okay. But then there's the other ones where it's just on a, a fucking card, like a postcard or there's no name or just signed a fan. You make a great target under those lights. You'll never see where it comes from. Bye bye. That was one of, <laughs> written on a yellow scrap of paper folded over in the middle and then and with no signature or anything. Or the one that was quoting Bible verses after I set fire to Ronnie Garvin. The fact that I set fire to a man's face. Well, this Bible verse says, Yea, you will burn in eternity. You have it coming. You will be 
judged by blah, 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 and this whole religious, you know, you think, well, hopefully I won't run into those people. But, uh, you know, but they didn't actually just come in and say, hey, now, the one time they did for DiBiase in, in Little Rock, I've told this story, but they actually phoned that into the building. Um, DiBiase was in a main event, I think, against Duggan for the North American title. And it was us in a rock and roll with me in the cage over the ring for the Mid-South Tag title. And the cops come in the locker room and, and told DiBiase, called him over in the corner. Somebody had called the, the box office and said, I want a front row ticket. And they said, well, those are sold out. And they said, well, how close can I get? And they said, sixth row or whatever. I want as close as I can get because I'm going to shoot Ted DiBiase and hung up. So they took that, the building, said, you know, because they didn't normally have people calling up saying, yeah, when the Stones play, I'm going to shoot Keith. Right? So they told... Uh, I get Jack Curtis was probably the the uh, guy that was the agent at that point, and he, you know, had extra cops come in, and they accompanied DiBiase out, extra police in the building watching the fans while they had their match, and then Teddy comes back, and he's fine and didn't get shot, and then I'm fucking pissed, right? Because now we got to go out. There may be a guy, a frustrated assassin out there with a fucking gun, and I'm going to be in the straight jacket hung over the ring so he can get a clear shot at me without having to worry about risking the life of any of the innocent fans. So I was in the cage. That's where I just sat down in the bottom of the cage, kind of leaned over and made myself small for the, uh, uh, for the duration of the match. But I mean, you know, it, 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 it depends on the threats. If it really, I mean, they were all bogus obviously because nothing ever happened, but if you're really going, if, 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 like a grandstand, I'm going to shoot the guy. That was more to ruin everybody's day, right? Or the bomb threat at the Channel 5 studio that time, just so they'd have to clear everything out. I always kind of took the ones in the mail, like, you know, you see this in true crime. He's he's sending the letters, and then finally he gets the equipment and goes out to find this guy. So, But we didn't worry that much then, because you, it wasn't like today. You couldn't find where people lived so easily. And and just, you know, track down everything about them. And also, fuck, I wasn't going to dwell on the negative. You know, I had too many people to piss <laughs> off. 